making India ready for emerging challenges amid the evolving global environment. So the challenges are coming amid a global environment, but not necessarily only because of the global environment. I'll try to discuss some domestic challenges as well. But we have to first discuss making India ready for the global challenges. And let me start. I don't want to introduce the guests because they're all so very well known. And uh, Pavitra has already introduced them. We will start by trying to look at what challenges are being thrown by the global environment and then, time permitting, look at some domestic challenges as well. Uh, let me start actually from the extreme right. Uh, 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 Sajid, what do you see as the global environment? On the one hand, as Pavitra read out, the uh, IMF is painting a picture of uh, global growth, which is likely to be, you know, half the pace it was this year. Probably, you know, from 6.2 to 3.2 to 2.7 next year is the kind of growth pace. So, do you see it as a year of slowdown, or do you see it as a soft landing plus inflation? Please detail. Uh, thank you, Lata. It's great to be here, and thank you to SPI and to Shama for inviting me. Um, this is, I think, the question, right? That um, are we in an environment where we're looking at a slowdown, or are we looking at something more disruptive? Is a more disruptive break imminent? You know, at the start of this year, Lata, the whole discussion was on reflation before the war. By June, it became recession. I would argue by November and December, we have to use the word resilience. And why do I say that? Think of what we've gone through in 2022. You've seen um, uh, you know, the strongest global inflation, especially in advanced economies in 50 years. This is the most synchronized and uh, coordinated uh, and aggressive tightening cycle in 40 years globally. We've seen the strongest dollar in 20 years. And what's less appreciated is we've seen China's growth will be the weakest this year since 1976 barring the pandemic year. In a normal year, two of these shocks would tip the global economy into recession. We've had four shocks simultaneously. And guess what? Your global growth is on course to print at 3% this year. So first, let's acknowledge how resilient the global economy and emerging markets have been in 2022. Why is that? Because this shock was always different. As we've discussed before, uh, especially in the US, uh, private sector balance sheets have been very resilient. U.S. households began with excess saving of almost $3 trillion. Corporate balance sheets in very good shape. So the private sector, unlike previous crises, has had plenty of firepower to withstand the shocks. Now, normally I'd put the mic down and say this is very good news. But in this crazy world we live in where good news is bad news and bad news is good news, this is not really good news. Because what it means is that if there's no recession that's imminent, and we at JP Morgan don't think there's a recession coming in the next six months, it means the chances of inflation going back to central bank targets around the world is lower, which means central banks around the, work, around the world have got more work to do. I'll end with two thoughts. Focus very much on labor markets in the US, on labor markets. This is the tightest labor market in 50 years. You're looking at uh, wage growth at about 5 to 6 percent. U.S. inflation of 2 percent is incompatible with wages at 6 percent, especially where productivity is slowing, which means, unfortunately, the Fed will have to slow the labor market, push unemployment up, push wages down, and only then will it have the confidence to bring inflation at 2 percent. In other words, Fed rates are going up, and they're going to stay high for long. And my first worry is the world has never seen 5% U.S. interest rates in 25 years. We've all grown up with 20 years of free money, zero interest rates, a Fed put. So the question is, is something going to break next year? Right? At 5% interest rates, is something around the world that we don't fully understand going to break? We saw a small preview of this in the pension fund. We saw this in crypto last week. So I'll end by saying, uh, right now, the good news is there's no recession. The sobering news is central banks will have to do more to bring inflation down. And in this higher for longer world, uh, is something going to break? Will we have a harder landing later on because growth is not slowing enough right now to disinflate? So in short, next year, are you expecting that uh, uh, a soft landing is impossible, that uh, we're going to have more than 5% Fed rate? Or you think it's at 5 but stays till 5 throughout the year? Uh, exactly what should be prepared for. So JP Morgan's baseline, like everybody else's, is agnostic because there's too much uncertainty. Our baseline currently has Fed rates at 5% and then they stop sometime in March. 
We have a situation where, as you said, global growth halves from 3% this year to 1.5% next year. But we have a quite um, benign situation where the U.S. only goes into recession later in the year. Okay. And it's a shallow recession, like the kind that Europe is having. If we can get through that year, that would be relatively benign in my, in my view. Ashima, would you want to add to that? Uh, most importantly, I would want to understand about this inflation part. Uh, are we going to continue to have, if you say that 2% is very difficult uh, immediately, are, we, are you preparing for a slightly higher level of global inflation? And what impact might that have on us? Well, I've, I've been saying that um, we need to distinguish Indian from U.S. inflation. This tight labor market, we don't have that, which gives persistence to, in, which gives persistence to, persistence to inflation and keeps it high. But I think there are certain uh, features in the global environment that, that are somewhat positive. One, that their long-term inflation expectations have not gone up that much and their interest rates now are in the restrictive territory or slightly positive territory with respect to that long-run inflation. So therefore, they might not need to raise much more. And then you are having a global uh, commodity slowdown, so that could bring down inflation faster than we expect. But of course, in the U.S., because of the huge stimulus and tight labor market, that is going to keep inflation high. And the second positive thing is that the Fed now is not saying that we are going to keep rates high until we reach 2% inflation, which is their target, because they've recognized lags that, you know, you link it to some, when it comes down to four, maybe you can stop and wait for further action. And then when you come to the Indian case, we have a, a lot of advantage. Can I come to the sure. Indian case now? Sure. So uh, I think I like to put it as double diversity. That is advantage for India because we have a very diverse economy. So, for, for example, recently now exports have gone down, but software exports are doing very well. We're seeing remittances go up and so on. Agriculture was down the last year, but it's looking like it might turn around. Domestic diversity. And then global, because um, the diversification from China, we're a very small part of exports. So even if we encourage the government schemes, PLI and so on delivers, already it is because electronics exports are still doing well. You know? So that sort of diversity is going to help India. And then finally, as we look at those pluri shocks, as Ananth was saying, we know that we've dealt with extreme, unexpected pandemic once in 100 years, and then a war, which seems interminable. So we have dealt with this, and we are doing relatively better. So we know that we can, we can handle. There is some resilience in the economy. And I think this comes from our monetary and fiscal policy, and as well as structural reform, being uh, sensitive to the Indian conditions. You know, like here, we had those food grain stocks. We provided security. And, uh, and at the same time, the shift to government spending towards infrastructure and other logistics, etc., to bring down costs. So very good monetary fiscal coordination. Monetary policy provided support, but time barred, so in line with reforms, it does not create poor incentives. It was withdrawn. The take-up of structuring is very little. We had the fastest turnaround, you know, where you are rebalancing liquidity because if rates are high, you have to bring liquidity down before you can raise repo rates. Yeah? Okay. So we have all these positives. And the last thing I must stop, must mention since I'm here, is that our financial sector is very strong. We went through 10 years of reform, restructuring. That is really substantial changes. And uh, so we are in a position to have slightly softer monetary financial conditions. Uh, the interest rate has gone up to recover from the pandemic lows, but it's not that high. And it is sufficient to allow activity to recover while the real rate is positive so that inflation, we are inflation targeting, so inflation expectations are continue to be anchored. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for that domestic bit as well. But I want to persist with the global environment with the other experts as well and then come back uh, to the uh, domestic analysis. Uh, Rajeshwari, you know, are people paint a picture of extreme global recession. That's one uh, you know, scenario that's painted. The other scenario is that it will be a soft landing. And uh, when, which way do you lean? Thank you so much, Lata. Uh, my first instinct was to say, am I audible? Because after two years of being behind the screen, that's the sentence that I got used to. Uh, 
And I must, before I say anything, I must thank SBI for inviting me. It's wonderful to be in person uh, along with so many people in the same room. Um, so just focusing only on the external sector for now, I think let's, let's look at it from two different angles. One is there's the US story and one is the European Union story. On the US, I think this is, the situation is relatively unclear. Because on one hand, the Fed is indeed embarking on the fastest pace of monetary tightening in the history, something that we have not seen. Yet on the other hand, and sort of following up on, on what Sajid said, I think there are three factors which are working in the favor of the US economy. One is that the households are sitting on a lot of savings, primarily because they received huge transfers during the pandemic, much of which got, much of, much of which got saved. Uh, secondly, uh, the real interest rate in the U.S. is still negative. Uh, the Fed funds rate is around 3.7 to 4 percent. The PC inflation is 6.2 percent. So they still have a real negative interest rate. Um, and unemployment is still quite low at 3.5, 3.7 percent, despite the fastest pace of monetary policy tightening. And the third point is the labor market is unusually tight, right? So for the longest of time in the U.S., the job vacancies exceeded the number of unemployed. Even now, there is that gap that persists. This can go one of two ways. One is the firms get desperate. They realize that they have to increase wages, uh, and they do that. The incomes go up, employment goes up, but at the same time, inflation goes up too. Or the firms realize that they cannot hire anymore because demand is going to slow down very soon. They give up. Wages fall, incomes fall, but then unemployment goes up, and we have a situation of recession. I don't think we're in a situation today to be able to predict which way that is going to go. Okay. So I'm going to say that the U.S. situation is relatively unclear. But I do agree that I think after 5 percent, the Fed is going to hold. And I think this Fed is relatively dovish in the sense that at the first signs of unemployment going up, they may even start considering discussions about when you start unwinding the tightening policy, so to speak. So it's very difficult to say what's going to happen next year. Now, what I want to focus on is, more than the U.S., I'm particularly worried about what's happening in the EU. Because I think the European Union is definitely headed towards a recession. Because unlike the U.S., they are dependent on Russia for natural gas. They're facing an energy crisis. They're facing an adverse terms of trade shock, which has sapped income. The industrial base has gotten very badly disrupted because production has gotten expensive. And you see the inflation rates in, in EU. I mean, EU has 10 percent, UK has 11 percent, is exorbitantly high levels of inflation. They haven't even started the kind of monetary tightening that the Fed is doing. They're lagging behind. So I would say for emerging market perspective, much of the risk lies in the European Union to the extent whichever EM is exposed to the EU definitely runs the risk of a lot of volatility. And there are also financial stability concerns in the European Union. So in the U.S., Despite a 3% increase of interest rate, the financial system has been extremely resilient. Because after the 2008 crisis, the U.S. financial system got much more conservative. We are not seeing any kind of financial sector blow up. But in the European Union, there are financial stability concerns in U.K., in Italy. So that, to me, would be the main area of concern. And again, China is the uncertain part in all of this as well, because we recently know China is really struggling to deal with COVID despite the zero COVID policy. So again, whichever EM, whichever country is exposed to China will end up facing that heat as well. So I'm going to stop here with the external sector and just stop by saying we are, we, are, we are facing radical uncertainty of a kind that we have not seen during our lifetime. Uh, and any kind of forecasting, be it GDP growth, be it inflation, it has become that much difficult. Which is better for India? Is it better if we have a recession because that will mean crude prices will be under control? Or is it better for us that there is a roaring growth and a roaring uh, inflation uh, outside, uh, more or less like we had in the earlier part of the current year? What suits India better? So let's talk to the question about between the two Hobson's choice of having a global recession versus, say, raging inflation, as you put it. I think that's between, you know, being between the devil and the uh, deep blue sea. Uh, which one is the choice that, you know, India would uh, uh, prefer if I had to? So let me, at the cost of significant simplification, um, I think that a global recession and the way uh, Sajid explained, which will be shallow uh, and would, I think would be slightly better than a raging inflation for the following reason. I think a global recession uh, will play out in the Indian context largely through the current account. So you have a decline in exports, increase in imports because India remains the fastest growing emerging market economy. 
and so larger trade balance and possibly higher current account deficit. No, no, that is you're saying a shallow recession plays to our advantage? To, yeah, so it will be current account negative, but I think it will be capital account positive okay. for the following reason that, um, you know, if you are expecting a global recession, that means the in interest rates have peaked and have started to come down. There is no flight to safety, so the rupee is not under pressure. There's a lot more macro stability, and some of the capital would start to flow back because India is doing well. So if you have a, so I feel a shallow global recession would be negative on current account, positive on capital account, overall good, compared to a raising inflation, which I think would be negative on capital account for the exactly the opposite region. And for the current account, it depends on where is the source of this raising inflation. If it is largely fuel and fertilizer, that's again going to be negative on current account. So overall, I feel in this the situation that you are describing, it will be less harmful for India if the world economy goes through a shallow recession than a very protracted inflation for the medium term. Okay. But can I just yeah. add a preface to this story that, you know, we talk about this as if this is like a one-time choice that the India has to face. But you know, the one thing is so 20 years ago, um, when a graduate student went to international finance course, we talked about uh, something called a uh, strong center and a weak periphery. That means there is this, uh, the large advanced economies where the custodian of global macro stability. So there will be all this crisis in the periphery countries, but when it spreads, it will be absorbed by the, uh, by the uh, core. Today it is completely reversed. The last five global crises have all originated in the rich countries. You know, whether it's dot-com, whether it's LTCM, it's global financial crisis, whether it's a cost of living index, all of them came from there. And the emerging markets are the study, and they have adopted a lot of the good practices that used to be. So in a sense, this is a part of life now for emerging, you know, for the central bankers in emerging market, this is something that they have to leave every day and not once in a decade, which used to be the case in the past. Shomyo, let me come directly to the uh, trade situation. This year, what, six months, we've only been discussing the rupee. And uh, therefore, what are we likely to face uh, if we have to be uh, ready in 2023 on the current account and the capital account front? The October trade deficit numbers were not a pretty picture. The uh, rate at which we have seen exports fall is scary. Imports fell, yes, from 60 billion, we came down to 56 billion, but almost entirely accounted for by the price of crude. So crude itself falling to $90 or $88 has not resolved the current account problem. It is actually keeping the current account problem pretty sticky. Will this be the run rate? I mean, 26, 27 billion trade deficit a month, and what are the, uh, how do we get ready for that? No, thank you, Lata. I think uh, current account deficit is actually uh, the external sector of India is turning out to be a very interesting proposition. Uh, if I all recollect, I think in July, we had one seminar where we attended in the RBI, I think, in uh, 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 Lonavala, and there the RBI forecast, I think, that was below 3%, 2.8%. And at that point of time, all the entire market consensus, including we also, we were expecting the current account deficit could actually breach 3.5%. Some estimates were close to 4%. But when the first quarter numbers were announced, and if you remember the expectations were close to 3.6, 3.7%, the numbers came in at 2.8%. So there was actually an 80 basis point cushion and a positive surprise, even though if you remember the first quarter was the worst hit in terms of the oil prices. After that oil prices had started to moderate a little bit. We actually looked into this aspect very carefully, and when we did an analysis, actually in terms of an, um, some technical specification, we found out that remittances and software exports are actually acting as a very strong buffer, counter-cyclical buffer to this current account deficit deterioration because of the crude oil. And the result showed that if, for example, if, if suppose if the model, if the trends uh, they indicate us, and in the second quarter GDP numbers which are due on December 31st are actually close to 3.5% even, then, then even the full year number could be closer to 3%.
So I don't know whether this will going to play out, but the re and the second quarter service exports, as the RBI data shows, have already been very strong. Remittances have been strong, but the important point to note about remittances is that, I mean, it has been strong, but whether it remains like this, that is a matter of debate because as rupee stabilizes, there is always a, I mean, a flavor that remittances could actually stabilize. But as of now, and for every dollar rupee depreciation, the software exports actually jumped by 250 million. So that was one of the results for model. So while I agree with the fact that this amount of trade deficit is unsustainable from a pure financing perspective, but if you actually look into these remittances and software exports, which has been very strong, that has acted as a very strong buffer in the first quarter. And if the second quarter numbers are to be believed, they could still continue to act that. If that is the case, we may escape this year with a deficit which may not be as high as was earlier anticipated. I'm not convinced of that argument. I looked at the services, exports and imports, and while I'm not able to put my finger at it, it doesn't reduce the current account deficit by as much as to bring it uh, below 3.5%. When I calculated, I still got about $120 billion uh, in terms of uh, current account deficit. Uh, Sajid, are you as confident as Somya? Um, so, uh, our forecasts, I think, are similar to the market where you're about 3.5, 3.6 percent. So, that's 120 GDP, billion dollars. 125 billion, I think the IMF is there. But let's just analyze this on a more fundamental basis, right? The current account deficit is ultimately the investment savings gap of an economy, which is the investment saving gap of the public sector and the investment saving gap of the private sector. In other words, it's the consolidated fiscal deficit and the private sector investment saving gap. Now, in the pandemic, the deficit rose like it did all around the world, and yet the current account didn't move because the private sector offset it completely. Private savings went up because people couldn't spend, private investment came down. Now, the good news is the private sector is normalizing, and therefore, almost by construction, public sector investment savings gap is spilling over to the current account. So if we want the current account deficit to come down to sustainable levels over the next 12, 24 months, which it must in this global environment, you have to have a more fundamental corrective. Which, which is, is bring down fiscal deficit? Which is that you need to bring the fiscal deficit down. This way you can keep the private sector humming along. So you want the private sector to grow. You want private investment to pick up, savings to go down, and to get an economic recovery. And for that to coexist with a sustainable current account deficit means you need to get consistent uh, fiscal consolidation, which I think is very much part of the plan. I'm also a votary of the belief that apart from this income effect, price effects matter, that the real effective exchange rate over time does have an impact on the current account X oil and gold. There's a lot of research that now shows that, including some work we've done. And frankly, we focus so much on dollar rupee, the real effective exchange rate this year has been flat. And to the extent that this terms of trade shock is a persistent adverse terms of trade shock, even if oil is at 85, it's still 25% higher than the pre-pandemic level or pre-war level. Some calibrated depreciation of the real effective exchange rate is not a bad thing. And I think the RBI, to its credit in the last couple of months, has been enabling that because that becomes your shock absorber. I keep saying it's like wearing a seat belt in a fast-moving car that if you suddenly break, yes, you get a bit of a shock from the seat belt, which is your exchange rate, but you prevent greater damage. I'll make one last point. I think Deepak made an excellent point about capital flows. Um, a lot of empirical work has found that one of the most important predictors of capital flows to emerging markets is the dollar index, the DXY. And the DXY has gone up in every single US recession strongly has strengthened barring 2008 for specific reasons. So yes, if we do get a shallower recession, you will get less strengthening of the DXY and that will mean that the prospect of capital flows coming into emerging markets will be better. But the current account is very much an idiosyncratic thing where we'll need to focus on the investment savings balance to make that sustainable. Thank you very much, uh, Shaumyo, Deepak, Rajeshwari, Ashima and Sajid.